Welcome to another edition of Pause for Thought with me, Greg. We've come to the end of our reflections on uh, Isaiah. So I thought I might look at some of the scriptures which remind us about how important and how deep and how precious is our relationship with God. We start with Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why would he do such a thing? Why would he send his only son? Remember John 3.16, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that all who believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So the question is, saved from what? If we go back to the book of Genesis, we see that life was perfect. God created Adam out of the dust, breathed his own breath, the Ruach HaKadosh, the blessed Holy Spirit, into him, and Adam lived. He took a rib and he created a partner for him in Eve. But even in that perfection, when they walked together in the cool of the day, danger was lurking because Anybody who knows about love, and I don't mean what the world thinks about love, will know that it is reciprocated by choice and free will. Otherwise, God could click his fingers and we'd all be robots. And there was danger lurking in that perfect garden of Eden in the form of the serpent. And Eve was tempted, led astray, incited. And disobeyed the command of God. To not eat from the tree in the center of the garden of knowledge of good and evil, life and death. And the serpent beguiled her, it says in some scriptures, saying how beautiful it was. And did God say you can't eat? All that will happen is that you'll know the difference between good and evil, life and death, and be like God. She ate and shared it with her husband, and he also ate. And that perfect relationship was broken. This must have broken God's heart. And the realization of what they'd done when they realized that they were naked and their eternal body was not the same. Of course, an eternal body would have no shame and they hid from God. And we all know that they were exiled from the Garden of Eden as this relationship was broken. And a mighty angel with a flaming sword was put to stop them going back into the Garden of Eden. Now you might say, well, why would he do that? Because it talks about the tree of eternal life. And if they'd have eaten of the tree of eternal life, as well as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, good and evil and that knowledge and our sinfulness would have lasted forever. And right from that moment, God sought a way to restore that relationship that had been given away. God had given the deeds and the authority of the whole planet to Adam and Eve. 
And in disobedience, they lost them. And Satan became the king of the earth. Lucifer, the angel of light, the light bearer, the deceiver. We hear how Abraham developed a relationship with God. And how that developed with throughout the history as God wooed and provided for the nation that he was going to set up and fight and give land and give laws. But because of sinfulness, because of our hearts, John 1, 10 following says, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but born of God. It says we must be born again. And that transaction with God comes about the indwelling of the blessed Holy Spirit when we repent and invite Jesus into our life as Lord and Saviour. But it's interesting the way in which the darkness, the sin, blots out the reality that God with us, the hope of glory. Jesus being at that time in front of them, performing miracles, transforming lives, raising the dead, casting out demons, but still because they chosen their own way and their own path and religion rather than relationship, they were blind to the incredible gift that God was offering. And in Revelation 3.20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in with him, eat with him, and he with me. So it's our choice. The invitation is there. The Lord is knocking on the door of our hearts, but we have to open those hearts and let him in. It's like that very famous Holman Hunt painting, which shows Jesus holding a lantern, knocking at the door. But the crucial part of that painting is there's no handle on Jesus' side. The person on the other side has to open the door and let the light of the world in. And when that happens, the light, Jesus, shines in the darkness. The Holy Spirit starts to challenge us, lead us to repentance, lead us to learn more, inspire us through the word of God, give us understanding, knowledge, wisdom. We all need that. Discernment, we need that even more. And we find that eventually, bit by bit, bit by bit, all that darkness is cast out and the Lord renews us and we're truly born again. We're different. And if that's not enough in Jeremiah 29, this is reinforced in verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Now, this is not God saying, you're going to be a robot and you're going to do this, that and the other. No, it says, I have plans for your welfare and not evil to give you a future and a hope. Because God loves us. God so loved the world. You and I. He cares about every aspect of our life. He cares that we 
are saved from evil and darkness and sin. He wants us to have a future and a hope. And that future and hope is with him and eternal life. Many people who have children as part of their family, as husband and wife, mum and dad, grandmother, grandfather, they will really love their children because they're part of them. I always used to struggle with that scripture which talks about unless you love the Lord more than mother, father, brother, sister, daughter, son, you can have no part in me. I used to think, well, how can that happen? Because naturally, I love my family and my parents, my grandparents. But then I discovered that as I yielded that relationship to God, I loved them so much more because I then saw my family as God saw them, which is different from the love I had. It was much more precious, much more deeper, much more compassionate. But all these things are a challenge because in our Western culture, we're all in the, in the head. We look for knowledge and understanding from what we can work out rather than believe and expect and trust in the miraculous. And that's why we need faith. And scripture says we only need faith as small as a mustard seed, which is a tiny little seed. And once that's planted, it's watered and grows into a huge shrub. And faith is believing in things that we can't see. Trusting in God's word or what he says. And acting upon it. And then we find that what's in scripture is validated and we see God working. Hebrews 11, it says, in verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who faithfully seek him. I can say from my life, I know that I know that I know that God exists. And I also know that even though Sometimes life is a bit of a roller coaster. The Lord has a plan for me, for my welfare and not evil, to give me a future and a hope and rewards those who faithfully seek him. Sometimes that reward is in family and friends and relationships or peace or healing or understanding or purpose or being loved or giving in love but this is the kicker in this confused 21st century people find it difficult to think about their sin and the need to turn from it and repent and receive forgiveness but they also think well you know I like doing these sinful things I'm used to them. They're comfortable and make me feel good. It's not about feelings. And in that case, if that's the case, then those people over there who are not Christian, who are doing all these things that I'm doing, well, who's to say they're wrong and we're right? And there are many who would say that there is one big mountain and there are many different paths lead into God from different religions, different perspectives, but they all lead to the same God. Scripture is clear. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Because the deception of the world leads us down rabbit runs, wrong paths, sinful nature, wickedness, evil, darkness, 
all started back in the garden with the serpent and Satan. And it's all God's initiative to make that way, to lead us into truth through the Holy Spirit, and to give us life, life in abundance, overflowing, pressed down, and abundant. And that can't come through religion, through following rules and regulations that priests or what, whoever set. It comes by grace, a free gift of God manifested through Jesus and the blessed Holy Spirit. Those who seek to work their way into heaven will find no matter what they do, it's never enough. But what Jesus did on the cross was completely and absolutely enough. And a free gift. We all know what we're like. We all know that we're not perfect. We all know that there's a long way to go. But Jesus has given us the way, the truth and the life to come to the Father where that incredible relationship is waiting and restoring what was at the beginning. John 6.40 says, it is the Father's will that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. And truly that is the reward that is worth putting aside the darkness, the sin, the deception, the self-centeredness, the idolatry, the wickedness, the nastiness, the hardness of heart and be transformed by the renewing of our minds through reading God's word and through faith in him and our belief in him. God is the same yesterday, today and forever. So trust him today and he'll bless you forever. So until next time, it's a big God bless you from me, Greg. Bye.